Thank you very much. Uh, carrying on from some of the themes of the previous uh, presentation, but at a slightly different scale. So archaeologists have long been looking at the shape of the landscape and reading it. We try to recognize what's there and to interpret the meaning of shapes in the landscape. And then we try to note down that meaning so that other people can see it and understand it. So we're trying to communicate shape to one another. Um, and there are ground and aerial survey traditions, particularly in the Anglophone uh, landscape topography world, going back to scholars like OGS Crawford and W.G. Hoskins. So we've been at this for a while. Um, and archaeologists, uh, uh, particularly working in the UK, have a very strong British field survey tradition that really emphasizes careful visual observation and measurement through repeated extended field visits and really a strongly embodied investigation of topographic subtleties. And the art of putting the resulting interpretations down on papers is usually codified into hasher plans. And I really think this is an art in this context, and no doubt there's a PhD somewhere in discovering and describing the different styles that different expert landscape photographers taught to their students. Um, but into this British field survey tradition, um, <coughs> developed through various efforts by Historic England and the Royal Commissions, we have the introduction of dense topographic data, largely in the form of airborne laser scanning, also cool photogrammetric methods, um, which proliferated fairly rapidly from circa 2005, I'm going to say. And this has started a conversation. It really prompted, in my experience, a mixed reaction in the field. On the one hand, everyone is really excited about this data because, quite simply, it revealed the invisible, particularly in forested and scrub areas. And even in open areas, it highlighted subtle topographic features in a way that just made their value of this data inarguable. But within all of this enthusiasm, there was a pervasive sense of disquiet, and I think disquiet is the right word, about the interpretation of digital topography. So the question is, what do we lose by doing our interpretation at the desk with digital data rather than in the field? Is it possible to know the site without visiting the site and being physically there? And can you interpret its topographic character? Do we engage less? Do we debate the presence of individual features less? No less, because the twin processes of recording and interpretation have been reconfigured by the digital media and are now inherently unfamiliar. So this is our ongoing conversation. But, of course, this didn't stop us from continuing to acquire digital data and work out new ways to manipulate and look at it, just because we were worried about the interpretive and recording process. And the present day situation is one of fairly widely available digital topographic data and many ways to visualize it and highlight different characteristics, different levels of sophistication, um, and different digital media and interfaces. And I would say we're all doing it with some reservations um, and about whether or not we're doing it the right way. And in this paper, what I'm hoping to do is to really focus on this sense of disquiet, these reservations that we have, and look at some things in our disciplinary history and just ourselves as humans that I think are at the roots of it and make a few possibly ineffective si proposals for how we can feel better about our engagement with digital landscape topography. So, giving us a bit of history. So artistic representations of landscape topography are an essential part of our disciplinary history. And these representations of terrain, like the one you see here, sit somewhere between technical correctness and an aesthetic expression of what the place is like. And we have a mixture that is achieved by different techniques and rules for certain parts of representation, like this 18th century rule-based method for drawing slope. Um, or this really beautiful illuminated contour map. This is a 1950s stylized representation of slope through contour, aspect, and illumination. And these are really choices that are made by the cartographer about how to balance the rules of the form so that the drawing can be read, so it has a clear grammar that I hope you can all understand, um, and composing the reality of the terrain compromising the reality of the terrain to make the representation readable. So there are rules, but we don't follow the rules strictly all the time in these visualizations. <coughs> 
Now, within these artistic forms of representation, we consistently use a few basic tools listed here um, to visually represent specific aspects of terrain. Aspect, surface normal, and illumination source being central to how we show the shape of terrain as humans. And an interesting thing happens when digital topographic data become commonplace because we translate these techniques that we've always used to represent different aspects of terrain from the artistic set of methods to computational rules. And this worked well in the sense that we continued to work with a highly representational world, one that suggested landscape topography but didn't attempt to render it realistically. But this transition wasn't entirely <coughs> smooth. So, for example, automatically generated contours, if you do this in ArcGIS, actually follow the terrain. Um, they are numerical isohypes rather than following how humans see the surface of the terrain and the form. And this difference between the actual shape of the train and how humans perceive that shape is an important distinction and is probably why you think your digitally generated contour maps are ugly. Um, so the calculated forms, you know, they use the same basic techniques, but they're missing that key element of human perception. And this has led to a recent push, notably by the geographer Kennelly, to create representations that are based more on how humans see the terrain than in the actual shape of the terrain um, itself, enhanced and visualized in different ways. So what is it we are doing here? We are attempting, I think, to cross the uncanny valley because we are saying that our digitally rendered landscape topography is realistic enough that we can show it without these formalized codified representations and that it's a mistake or at least unnecessary to cross over into these very formal codified representational forms. And I think this brings us to the root as we're trying to make this jump of many of our qualms about working with topography in our archaeology standard digital environment, which is GIS. Um, when we bring our highly realistic digital topographic data into a GIS environment, most of the time we are flattening it to 2D or 2.5D, we like to say. Um, and we know in our gut level that when we flatten it, when we codify it into these different representational forms, our eye brains, our internal systems for seeing, observing, recording, and interpreting are not going to engage. Perception is not going to work in the same way as with the physical actualized landscape. And that's because it exists in 3D. And this makes us nervous. This is our uncanny valley moment. And if you're interested in research behind how your eye brain engages differently with 3D and 2D, I highly recommend a Pizlo's 3D shape and making a machine that sees like us as a starting point. These are both really interesting. So I want to talk a little bit more about 3D and your brain and what we want from them. Because what we want, I think, is to work with a realistic rather than a representational form when dealing with 3D data. So without passing through this strongly codified representational form in a 3D interface so that our eye brains can engage properly. Um, and here we arrive at another root of our collective disquiet. Because most of us who use 3D interfaces really hate them. They're terrible. They're even worse than the 2D software interfaces. They feel weird somehow. They feel uncomfortable. We can't move around properly. Things don't look right. It's hard to manipulate the tools. And I'm going to suggest that we don't hate 3D data. On the contrary, we love 3D data. But we do hate the current 3D interfaces and that this is an uncanny valley problem because the data look real. And they look so real that we want to interact with it like it's real, naturalistically, with our bodies. And then the interfaces don't let us do that. The interfaces are not naturalistic. So what is this uncanny valley problem I've been talking about? Many of you may be familiar with it. In aesthetics, it's a hypothesized relationship between the degree of an object's resemblance to a human being and the emotional response to such an object. The concept of the uncanny valley suggests that humanoid objects, which appear almost but not exactly like human beings, elicit uncanny or strangely familiar feelings of eeriness and revulsion in observers. And I'm going to suggest that the same thing happens with landscapes um, when we try and engage with them in virtual 3D space that the gap between something that strongly represents a real landscape but doesn't, when we start to interact with it, behave like one, causes these same feelings of discomfort and disconnection. 
And it's because of our experience of the physical landscape being so inherently unbodied that we also have this uncanny valley reaction to hyper-realistic landscapes when we interact with them unnaturalistically. So it's much the same problem that we have when we interact with extremely humanoid robots. Um, and hasher plans and other strongly codified representational schemes don't have this uncanny valley problem. And there are two reasons why our brains are happy with hashers. First, because they are so unrealistic that our brains immediately categorize them as representation rather than potentially real. And second, because once our brains happily think these are representational and they're in the representation box, it's a fairly simple set of rules and your brain can kind of follow along. Um, and we have a long tradition, therefore, of using hashers to cultivate visual attention as you're creating a drawing in the field and to think about topography as you're reading the drawing. On the other hand, extremely dense point clouds have this problem. Our brains can look at this and, in spite of the pointless experience, happily interpolate to see when they're static a real enough representation. And shaded terrain models like this one, viewed from a slight distance and angle, produce a real enough response once you've seen a few, like you're looking out the window of an airplane in low light. So here's where we get unhappy with interface. Because in a physical landscape, we have a nice separation between the real landscape that we're interpreting that our body's inside and the paper medium where we're recording things. And when we work in a digital interface, we're smashing these things together. We're putting the real and the representational char categories into the same physical digital space. So what is our new process and medium for digital topography that supports engagement, visual attention, interpretation, and communication? What is it we are actually going to do? Um, to, and how can we prepare ourselves to work in this 3D environment and continue to achieve our goals of extended focused observation and recording of the landscape and communicating to someone else why you see what you see? And how can we carry out the tasks we undertake while working towards these goals in our usual nonlinear fashion? <coughs> so I think what we have to do is step one, decondition ourselves from thinking that digital equals representational and really think about naturalism in digital media. If I show you a photorealistic thing in a digital medium, are you going to see what I see? These are the questions we need to ask and I think if they're naturalistic enough, you more or less will. And so what I want to have is a situation where we are teaching ourselves digital field observation skills. I'm going to suggest that we need to learn to get to this point of shared seeing in our digital realistic media using many of the skills and behaviors we enact while observing in the field. So we need to point at things for one another in a digital space and draw along an obvious contour to get people to a less obvious thing um, and use in a minimal way, a formal codified representational language, um, but much less formalized than the practice of drawing in the field. Because we are now in a situation where we can combine sparse highlighting and a dense visual underlay of the data itself. So I have four specific suggestions I'm going to make for us quickly here. One is that we can mark locations of interest and show these markers with the realistic digital landscape topography in the same space because these very basic markers are basically like pointing at something in the field. You're just pointing. Second, I'm going to suggest that we consistently work in perspectives that continually remind our brains that we're in 3D space and encourage more naturalistic visual perception. So at hu as humans, we have naturalistic experience of seeing things from standing on a hill and looking down, or as modern humans from an airplane window, so we can all do that. The orthographic view, which we commonly find in GIS, we have no naturalistic experience of. So this isn't actually very good for our engagement and perceptual capacity. Perspective and axonometric views have significant advantages, as shown here in a Sketchfab model of an Iron Age town at San Quibrao. Um, and it's also useful to include a scaled object of known size so people can kind of understand how big they are, although this is less of a problem when you can move around. Um, and so you can then combine these viewpoints, um, these visualizations with 3D perspective and overview and pointers and really start to just show people what is going on. So proposal number three, 
Um, I'm going to suggest we use sparse selected contours, so just a few contours, um, following kind of the practice of rule-based contours, but suggesting the perceived shape of the terrain, communicating what we're seeing. And this is like tracing along something with your finger, only slightly more permanent so people can follow what's going on. Um, and this is going to let people see what's happening without necessarily covering your whole drawing with lots and lots of contour lines. Fourth and finally, I'm going to suggest we follow conventions for how human vision works in defining the field of view and area shown against support naturalistic perception. Your 3D vision works best within 30 degrees of the center, so we should be doing that with our digital cameras. Um, and here you can see the effects of different fields of view and depth cueing, so things fading out as they get further away. So humans perceive shape in a certain area uh, within our visual field, and we really want to mimic this in our digital visualizations. So, where does this leave us? I'm going to suggest that current digital terrain data takes us beyond the uncanny valley, and therefore we can enact enact our interpretive process in a digital environment using naturalistic renderings of the terrain without passing into a strongly codified representational form. I've proposed a few very basic techniques for working with digital landscape topography, a set of rules and methods designed to be deployed by a practitioner as they observe, depict, and interpret the terrain. And these techniques are really grounded in our informal behavior as observers and communicators of visual information in the physical landscape the act of pointing at what you see. So what remains for us now is to try it, to teach ourselves to work in a new way, to teach others to work in a new way, in a medium where not all the rules are written yet, to embrace our double role as observers and interpreters, and to be explorers beyond the bounds of our present systems of representation and ways of doing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.